Friends and travelers, however you've arrived, I bid you welcome. Here at Let's Be Frank, we're about lives, but above all, living well. I don't suppose a podcast hosted by Benjamin Franklin could be about anything else. In my lifetime, I pursued the practice of moral improvement like a science, recording my successes, and yes, oftentimes, reveling in my failings. It's my hope with our weekly almanac, to deliver to a curious world delicious morsels of history in quick, easy-to-digest installments, perfect for a sit in your favorite chair or a morning walk to work. At the end of each installment, I like to wrap it up in a neat little lesson you can apply to your own life, taken from the events, stories, and personalities shared in each episode. So sit back, relax, and together, let's make history. Greetings and salutations, dear listener. Welcome to another installment of Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind, with me, your faithful friend and host, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. Follow B. Franklin Live across our varied social media platforms. B. Franklin Live on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind on Facebook www.bfranklinlive.com for resource materials from each episode, and if you wish to support the history we try to make every week, consider becoming a member of our Patreon. Unlock exclusive content like Behind the Benjamin and This Past Week, participate in polls to decide the content of new episodes, or what we'll talk about on Ben Franklin Reacts, a collaboration betwixt myself and my producing partners at Primary Source Media. But above all, my beloved Junto, to participate in an ever-growing community of people devoted not only to history, but the difference it can make in their lives. Now more than ever, we need you, my dear friend. So join our Patreon and see what all the fuss is about. It's been a historic week in 2024, but what was going on in Ben Franklin's life 200 years ago today? The answer to that can be found in this week's edition of This Past Week, a Patreon-exclusive piece of content where every week I bring you a primary source from the week our episode takes place. This week's edition of This Past Week features a letter addressed to Thomas Jefferson, where I'm congratulating him on his role as Minister to France, as well as giving several important letters of introduction. These letters of introduction were essential in my time to prove someone's trustworthiness, but also to help them further their ends in a new place. Catch this exciting piece of content on our Patreon page. Now, with that out of the way, we can get to today's installment. For purposes of good order, this podcast is composed of several primary sources associated with Ben Franklin's life, knit together with original writing to collect it all into one narrative on a cohesive theme. Today's episode is about where we come from, where we're going, and the value we find in each along the way. Several nights ago, I had at table several members of the American Philosophical Society for a dinner party. Most were old acquaintances, but among them were several new. Strangers became acquaintances, acquaintances became friends, and enforced in me a sentiment I have long held. Share a table with strangers, and you can acquaint yourself with the world. But never before was there a greater diversity of opinions and peoples around my table than my time as diplomat in France. That during my first trip abroad to France, when I was best known for my endeavors scientific rather than statecraft, I had the honor to be presented to the then king and queen of France, and got my first glimpse at the pomp and pageantry of the Grand Covert where the royal family dined with the public outside the Palace of Versailles. On this particular time, I kept company with Sir John Pringle, first baronet and president of the Royal Society. Not to be confused with the Pringle of the same name that revolutionized the keeping of potato crisps in a tube to maximize their freshness. That's a joke, dear listener. When Sir John and myself were presented to the king and queen, they did him honor of asking questions after the royal family of England, and had invested care to ask him questions of his own. What surprised me on that particular occasion was the care and interest their majesties took in asking after myself in a setting where the ribbons 
badges, sashes, and accomplishments of one's family long dead determine someone's worth, there I was, a man of no exceptional quality outside the contributions of my own lifetime, commanding the attention of kings. Which leads us toward today's topic, where we wear our honor. Journey back with me, dear listener, to the year 1784. I was diplomat in France, having too much fun for any well-respecting septuagenarian to have, surrounded by the glories of this world and amusements of all sorts. Both at the Palace of Versailles and in Paris, I found a prodigious mixture of magnificence and negligence, with every kind of elegance except cleanliness. America had just received her independence. The ink on the Treaty of Paris was drying, and as the door was closing to the insults and injuries that led to the Revolutionary War, an entirely new door of calamity was swinging open to strike our new nation in the nose. Our Articles of Confederation were proving every day deficient. It was growing increasingly difficult as a foreign diplomat to correspond with the feeble Congress of Confederation, ever at odds with itself, now that we did not have the fight against the British Lion to unify us. Soldiers were going without pay, but most of all, we were a new nation with no model for how we might conduct ourselves. People longed for means to express who they were. If we could no longer be British, and indeed we were too different to be Americans, whom could we be? One of the truest and earliest institutions of unity across the 13 United States was the Continental Army. And when they disbanded, a great many wished to find a new way to immortalize those bands of consanguinity into a new society. In May of 1784, a group of soldiers would form a new organization, a fraternity, that would honor the blood spilled, wounds earned, and liberty purchased by those brave individuals who fought for the independence of all Americans. They called it the Society of Cincinnati, in honor of Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, hero of ancient Rome. Before I fall too far into another tangent, the example Americans took from ancient Rome is a discussion in and of itself. So I will endeavor to be brief and give you the bare minimum of what you need to know so we can continue with the story. Cincinnatus was a farmer who, when Mother Rome was in danger, set aside his plow to take up the title of dictator, and sword boldly in hand beat back the foreign horde of enemies. Peace restored, the people so in awe of this hero begged him to keep the laurel and remain king. Cincinnatus, loving Rome and liberty too much, cast it aside to once more take up the humble plow. It was exactly the symbolism in infant America, particularly the soldiers who left farm and field behind to fight for independence, needed. Washington was the new Cincinnatus, the farmer who, when offered the crown, returned to his vine and fig, the soldiers, suddenly the chosen people of God, bound to beat their spears into plowshares, their swords into pruning hooks. There was only one small fault I found with this new society, which leads us back to that 1784 letter. This new society was to be hereditary. Now, in my opinion, the institution cannot be of much importance. In fact, I will agree at the suggestion of friends to not make these sentiments known publicly in my lifetime. However, now being quite dead, I feel I might ask your indulgence in humoring me as I share them. Dear listener, it should come as no surprise despite in many of our founding charters expressing a dislike for ranks of nobility and hereditary titles, that a number of private persons should think proper to distinguish themselves from an order of hereditary knights or nobility, composed of those who have been too much struck with the ribbons and crosses they have seen hanging or the buttonholes of foreign officers. It is a truth most eternal that if people can be pleased with small matters, it is a pity that they should have them. In this view, perhaps I should not myself, if my advice had been asked, which it wasn't, have objected to their wearing the ribbon and badge themselves according to their fancy. My objection is in entailing it as an honor on their posterity, i.e., passing these honors down to your children and their children. For honor, worthily obtained, is in its nature a personal thing, and incommutable to any but those who had some share in obtaining it. Is this the best mold for encapsulating virtue and nobility? 
There are some nations about the globe, much older and wiser than our own, where honor does not descend, but ascends. If an individual, from their learning, their wisdom, or their valor, is promoted to a rank of note, their parents are immediately entitled to all the same ceremonies of respect from the people that are established as due to the individual themselves, on the supposition that it must have been owing to the education, instruction, and good example afforded to them by their parents that they were rendering capable of serving the public. This ascending honor is therefore useful to the state, as it encourages parents to give their children a good and virtuous education. But the descending honor to a posterity who could have no share in obtaining it is not only groundless and absurd, but often hurtful to that posterity, since it is apt to make them proud, disdaining to be employed in useful arts, and thence falling into poverty, and all the meanness, servility, and wretchedness attending it, which is the present case with much of what is called the nobleness in Europe. Or, if to keep up the dignity of the family, estates are entailed entire on the eldest male heir, another pest to industry and improvement of the country is introduced, which will be followed by all the odious mixture of pride and beggary and idleness that have half depopulated and decultivated certain states among the theater of the world. And perhaps it's my deep devotion to democratic virtue that balks at this puffed-up notion of nobility, or perhaps it's an avowed desire to preserve my vanity. Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words without vanity, I may say, etc., but some vain thing immediately followed. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever the share of it they may have themselves, but I give it fair quarter wherever I meet with it, being persuaded that it is often productive of good to the possessor and to others. By my rambling digressions I perceive to have grown old. I used to write and speak more methodically, but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. Tis perhaps only negligence. The summation of all of this, before we set this sword down for a plowshare, is this. Beware of hereditary nobility, the seed of distension, hatred in domestic ways. Whoever acts righteously in order to obtain a recompense is unworthy of the republic and of humanity. Make your monuments of thought, not of men. Am I saying, in all this conflagrated language, that one should not take pride in where one comes from? Not in the slightest, dear listener. I have ever had the pleasure in obtaining any little anecdotes about my ancestors, having emerged from poverty and obscurity into which I was born and bred, to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity, the conducing means I made use of and that you may find suitable to your own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. But only the good parts, dear listener. Enough of my life for now. Autobiographies are simply justified self-praise. Being absent of noble beginnings, I made it my practice early in life to try to live nobly, until notable reputation was obtained. I was successful with that, and I will gladly share my methods with you, dear listener. Towards the latter half of the 1720s, I conceived the bold and arduous project of moral perfection. I wished to live without committing any fault at any time. I would conquer all that either through natural inclination, custom, or company might lead me into, as I knew or thought I knew what was right or wrong. I did not see why I might not always do the one and avoid the other, but I soon found I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I had imagined. In the various enumerations of the moral virtues I had met with in my reading, I found the catalogue more or less numerous, as different writers included more or fewer ideas under the same name. Temperance, for example, was by some confined to eating and drinking, while others it was extended to mean the moderating of every other pleasure or appetite, inclination or passion, bodily or mentally, even to our avarice and ambition. I proposed to myself, for the sake of clearness, to use rather more names with fewer ideas annexed to each than a few names with more ideas, and I included under thirteen names of virtues all that at that time occurred to me, as necessary or desirable, and annexed to each a short precept, which fully expressed the extent I gave to its meaning. The names of these virtues, with their precepts, were 1. Temperance. Eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. 2. Silence. Speak not but what may benefit others or yourself. 
Avoid trifling conversation. 3. Order. Let all your things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. 4. Resolution. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. 5. Frugality. Make no expense but to do good for others or yourself, i.e., waste nothing. 6. Industry. Lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. 7. Sincerity. Use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly, and if you speak, speak accordingly. 8. Justice. Wrong none by doing injuries, or omitting the benefits that are your duty. 9. Moderation. Avoid extremes. Forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. 10. Cleanliness. Tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation. 11. Tranquility. Be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents common or unavoidable. 12. Chastity. Rarely use venery but for health or offspring, never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another person's peace or reputation. 13. Humility. Imitate Jesus and Socrates. My method of moral improvement was straightforward. For each new day, a different virtue was to be the subject of my focus, recognizing that in focusing on all, inevitably, I should stumble upon one or another. In being moderate, I would not be resolute. In honoring justice, I would not be silent. In promoting industry, I would sacrifice chastity. I shan't go further into that. The lesson derived from it all, dear listener, is to be the best edition of yourself today. Be proud of where you've come from, but don't rest upon it as a prop. What wonders can arise if you devote yourself to self-revolution? And if you do, what honors may lay waiting ahead? To quote the wisdom of Bridget Saunders from Poor Richard's Almanac in 1733, Each age of men new fashions doth invent, things which are old young men do not esteem, what pleased our fathers doth not us content, what flourished then we out of fashion deem. And that's the reason, as I understand, why Prodigious did sell his father's land. I think of how this might be applied to a nation. If we place our heraldry ahead of us, and all our honors on our future, could it be possible that we might leap above the snares and brambles of nostalgia, and dare courageously ahead towards a future fixed on innovation? Brave are a people who honor the past by learning from it, and honor the future by earning for it. The grandest of things may come from the humblest beginnings, and a man can do nothing with yesterday, everything today, for something tomorrow. That's all for today's installment. Would that we had more hours in the day, but as always, we have nothing but time between us. Resource materials and images from this week's episode can be found in the journal section of B. Franklin Live. If you like the show, subscribe to stay up to date with all the latest gossip and do me the kindness of leaving a review. Catch us on social media, YouTube, and join our Patreon to support the history we make every day. And, dear listeners, spread the word. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbor, tell your horse, I don't care. Let's make our intellectual junto grow. And now, dear listener, our time together has come to an end. Fare thee well. And always remember, when you are good to others, you are best to yourselves. Until we meet again, I remain your humble and obedient servant, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. Stay curious, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>